Um, so where do investors put their money now that yields are at record low and the equity markets are on fire? We have a panel of experts to help us break it down and uh, hopefully without plugging their own products and services too much. Um, to my right, uh, we'll start with Mark Antanasio, co-founder and managing partner of Crescent Capital Group. And we have uh, next to him, uh, Colleen Campbell, Vice Chair of Investment and Corporate Banking for BMO Capital Markets. Lowell Kraft, to my left, Executive Chairman and Co-Founder of Trivergence. Sol <laughs> Soren Ryan, <laughs> sorry, this was a joke because I can't pronounce his last name. Soren <laughs> Re Re Reinerson, Reinerson, Reinerson? Good enough. No, it's Good not, enough. it's bad, correct me. Reinerson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he's managing, uh, managing General Partner of GLC Advisors. And then we have Justin Slackey, Senior Portfolio Manager for Shepman Capital Management. Thank you. Okay, so let's start, I guess, with the most controversial topic. Um, I know there are divergent views on this panel as to whether we're, we have a bond bubble. Um, Soren, what's the case for it? What's the case for it? I'll, I'm happy to start it off, and I look forward to being debated on. Uh, the fact of the matter is, this, in, in, our, in our view, in my view, there clearly is a bond bubble. Uh, bond leverage loan bubble that's uh, taking place right now. The, the, the charts demonstrate pretty, uh, pretty decisively that we're reaching volumes of issuance and yields which are at, uh, at records. Uh, having said that, and you have to take a look, peel back the onion a little bit because the yields are, are only one component uh, of what's actually happening in the marketplace today. What's important to see is that, for example, in the leverage loan market, fully half of what's being transpired, what's being, uh, uh, the loans that are being put to market today are merely repricings, effectively a transfer of value from the lenders to the borrowers. In and of itself, not unhealthy, but it gives you an idea that lenders are willing to do uh, very, very unique things in order to maintain credit exposure in today's market where there is otherwise no yield. I think what's more disturbing or potentially destructive uh, from, from our perspective, and I, I run a restructuring advisory firm, is the, the lack of covenants that are being placed in, into both leveraged loans as well as even in high yield. Uh, on the leveraged loan side, clearly it's the, the lack of maintenance covenants that provide the early warning indicator so that lenders can come to the table when the situation is stressed as opposed to waiting until it gets distressed. Uh, when it gets distressed, obviously, you, get, you find yourself in a situation where the company is looking, or the company, the managers, may very well be out, fully out of the money, yet fully in control of the business. So the alignment of incentives amongst the parties is not, uh, is not one in which it creates overall enterprise value, but the managers may very well be one to do Hail Marys and try to achieve, uh, to get back into the money. Even in the leveraged loan, or excuse me, the high yield market, you're seeing a lack of covenants, whether it's uh, asset sale provisions and affiliate transactions and the like, all of which erode investor protections. So the charts show issuance going up. The underlying is harder to evaluate, but I think it's, it's clear that you've got to be able to evaluate that as well. I think we have uh, slide nine that kind of demonstrates uh, covenant quality, and Moody's put out a report, I think it was last week, that uh, said that covenant quality is probably at its lowest level since it started tracking that. So I guess the poster child for this is uh, TXU, as we've talked about. Uh, are the credit markets of today creating future TXUs? You, Justin, don't think so. Well, they will at some point. Uh, but what I, I would say, especially after two days uh, here at the Milken Institute, it's pretty clear uh, that uh, the markets are artificially in inflated by the Fed stimulus or steroids that they've put into the system. Uh, that being said, the effect on the credit markets is that it extends the credit cycle. It pushes out defaults. It pushes out any issues that may occur. Uh, and therefore, we think we'll be in this cycle through 2014. If you pull up slide page 25, uh, number 25, Soren talked a lot about the charts and they're showing uh, that um, what's happening with new issuance. And we think that one of the big pieces that people are missing about new issuance is where new issuance is going. 70% of all new issuance in high yield is refinancing. Refinancing is actually good for companies. It pushes out maturities, and actually for those companies, it's lowering the interest that they're paying. 
which again pushes off any issues that may occur. Uh, the second thing is you can see here uh, on this chart, what you'll see is the last two cycles, we saw a clear increase in leverage coming out of what were issues, and then a subsequent decline when there became uh, a bubble in the high yield market. You could see it going into 2000, and then you can see it going into 2008. This time around, what you'll see is we've been hovering right around that four and a half times. It started to pick up a little bit at the end of 2012 with tax policy changing and dividend deals increasing a little. And immediately, as we've started at the beginning part of this year, you see it's come back down. This is all new issuance only around four times. So you really have not seen an increase in the leverage of the high yield market. And I think the key part of this is what is happening within the high yield market is a totally different market than what we saw in 07 when there really was a bubble. Mark, do you, do you agree? Yeah, one of the things we look at is actually not just leverage but interest coverage. And um, we better tracking on that in our private portfolios. And even though leverage is, is creeping up a little bit uh, in the markets because uh, with the wave of bank refinancings, uh, interest rates are so low on bank debt. You know, double B bank debt today is in the threes. Uh, and bank debt tends to be about four terms of leverage in a capital structure. Uh, interest coverages actually are up uh, relative to uh, the 06, 07 timeframe, and so there's more cushion. Uh, companies have more cushion to uh, pay their debt down. Now, you know, the, I think the real the risk underpinning the market is if interest rates go up, uh, a large part of these capital structures are going to uh, go up with floating rate debt in the bank loan piece and you know, then you could have several companies that have credit issues with, with some of these leverage multiples that don't seem to today. But the flip side of that is people are saying interest rates aren't going up. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's what, you know, you look at um, fund flows, and uh, interestingly, while there's record transactions uh, in the high yield market, there's very few fund flows into our market, but very high fund flows into the investment grade markets, which allow things like Apple to price. <laughs> you know, uh, deal the way they did in uh, whatever, 2% to 2.4% tenure. And I think I read there was $52 billion of demand for the Apple uh, transaction, $52 billion. So at the same time fund flows have abated in the high yield market, they have increased sharply into the investment grade uh, mutual funds and the investment grade markets. And I think that's a, a function of folks thinking interest rates are going to stay low for a while. Do you buy the Apple credit or no? Well, we're, uh, we focus on below investment grade. You know, I worked, uh, I started my career working for Mike at Drexel uh, in the mid 80s and uh, never imagined I'd see a high yield market yielding 5.4%. <laughs> I have to read uh, we, yeah. we had some bonds back in 1985 that yielded 5% a quarter. <laughs> so uh, uh, I never thought I'd, I'd see this day, uh, much less a, a trillion dollar market or, um, you know, an average in our high yield bond, public high yield bond portfolios, the average cash flow approximates a billion dollars uh, in each company, maybe 800 million of EBITDA on average in our high yield portfolios. Uh, so the market is really matured. And so some of what you're seeing uh, with some of these statistics and, and some of the yields is uh, maturation of the market. Um, if we can go to slide five, it shows. Um High yield and leverage loans refine, refined, refinanced out to 2017. The question is, I guess, what happens after, after that, Colleen? Yeah, you know, this, this rush into anything with a coupon, um, you know, I, and we've seen it not only just into, into the high grade and the, the high yield market, but when you look at even what's going on in stocks, uh, a rush into yield stocks away from, from growth stocks and, and a, a movement of out of stocks into high yield bonds or into leveraged loans. And, you know, it's a, when you look at where we are in the rate sunk cycle, and certainly, you know, it doesn't look like anything imminent on the rate side, but uh, we've never had this level of stimulus in the history of the markets without there being a snapback. So, when you look at the, as well, within the leverage space, the amount of it that's going into leveraged loans versus bonds with the variable rate uh, outlook, as was discussed. Um, I don't think we're in a bubble now, but we, there, there's going to be a, a, a change in the rate environment, and uh, we're not well set up for it, for sure. Um, and um, 
when you look at the dates around that, uh, the, the timeline with, uh, with refi, uh, if, if, when you, if you do get a snapback, that's when you're going to see a, a credit event. I don't think we're going to see a credit event. I think we're, we're seeing on the credit side, uh, they are pushing on the covenant side. I've always said covenants don't pay back loans, but... Um, Investors are pushing on the covenant side, or...? Uh, well, issuers, issuers, because of the froth, I mean, every issuer we deal with uh, wants a cov, cov light situation, and if the market will support it, they're going to always ask for it. Uh, but, but credit quality through this part of the cycle to date has actually been quite strong. Um, one of the things, actually, uh, that banks aren't doing anymore is uh, lending to middle market and, and smaller companies. That's created a lot of, um, you know, formation around uh, business development corporations, and, and we see a new one being formed every day. The question is, you know, is the, is the return that you're getting worth the current fees that you're paying to get that? return and a lot of investors I was talking to Joe Deere earlier saying it's really a structure that's advantageous to the manager not uh, the investor so Lowell can you give us your thoughts on that sure um, before I do I'd like to um, thank you for allowing me to be on this panel I don't think that was my decision <laughs> I'd like to thank the Excuse the Milken me. Institute it's a it's a fabulous institution and what Mike Milken has done to put together such a phenomenal pool of talent and knowledge. Uh, I'm, just, I, I'm very humbled and, and proud to be able to be part of this. I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, regarding BDCs, uh, BDC has, is a great phenomenon of, for, of permanent capital. It works for the externally managed asset management firms, and I do believe it works for the borrowers and the investors. Everybody wins. I believe everyone wins. Uh, we've worked closely with uh, a couple of the largest BDCs, uh, both Apollo and Aries. I believe they were the original two BDCs back in 03 and 04. Uh, Aries really uh, kind of became the platinum standard. They never uh, lowered their dividend and um, it's become the go-to place for middle market lending because banks are out of that business. Uh, I personally have invested in some BDCs and the yield in a zero interest rate environment, environment has been incredible. Um, you're also seeing some private BDCs and money's being raised in an incredible, uh, incredible velocity from individual investors and institutions, and I think they're here to stay. I believe you're going to see some very creative BDCs that are going to figure out how to play in lower tranches of the capital structure, looking for more equity-like returns. Um, you may see something in the crowdfunding space. Uh, we're very bullish, and uh, we're excited about that vehicle, and we're also excited about other permanent capital vehicles that'll play more towards the private equity side of the ledger. I'm probably the only one here in this panel who comes from more of a private equity merchant banking perspective. Um, and the controversy over carried interest and what Washington DC is gonna do about that, uh, I believe you'll see some great creative and intellectual capital uh, and strategy towards coming up with new investment vehicles. That Private equity has been trying that for a while now, and they haven't succeeded in getting around uh, potential carried interest, uh, increase in carried interest taxation. So, You will see, in my opinion, some public, public vehicles that will look more like platform companies, and you'll see private equity firms using these private investment vehicles to acquire companies and then acquire additional, additional companies that will become public holding companies of, you know, in, in, you know, I'm not going to say private equity public vehicles because 1940s Act doesn't really allow for that, but you will see some creative things, and I think you'll see some things announced in the next 30 days. Stay tuned. From who? Can't say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, you said a few months ago uh, that private 
credit is generating better, better returns than public credit. Is that, is that still true? Uh, yeah, I think pretty much, uh, you know, at Crescent, we've been in business for 20 years now, and, and even when I worked, you know, for Mike and Drexel, you've always had a spread between private and public, so private's been a good place to be, provided you could manage the liquidity risk, and that is generally a focus on, on credit quality. And there's a spread, uh, not as much of a spread as you'd sometimes like. You know, some of the direct lending that we do, um, BDC-like direct lending, three times debt to cash flow companies, uh, is more in the 8% range versus, a, you know, maybe a, a high four single B bank loan. Um, you like that to be a little wider. Uh, however, in mezzanine, we, we still have very wide spreads, interestingly, over over 20 years, um, our average coupon has been, you know, right around 12%. Whether treasuries were at 10% or treasury 10-year treasuries at, you know, 2%. Uh, right now, our most recent vintage of mezzanine fund has a weighted average coupon of 1170. So, you know, and, and why is that? And the reason for that is uh, to find that piece of the capital structure is hard. There's still a lot more. Uh, companies that need a mezzanine piece than there are providers. Mm -hmm. And that piece of the capital structure doesn't move the needle. It's only eternal leverage generally, if that. So uh, if you have a company which is financed to five times debt to cash flow and four multiple turns are in the bank loan and one multiple turn is in the mezzanine, if a company pays a lot for mezzanine, it doesn't really affect the credit quality. So we've been able to maintain our coupons you know, there. And I think private is, is uh, really a good way to go. The challenge is, as always, to find transactions. Uh, yesterday in the private equity panel, some of the uh, leading sponsors in the country talked about how challenging an environment it is now for you know, finding transactions. And uh, you know, it's, it's something that you know, we face as well in the private, uh, in private territory. But uh, there's definitely opportunities in any any time you can originate product, and and you mentioned like with Aries, you know they're terrific at that. And BDC is where they're able to get better. One of the reasons BDCs work is firms like Aries and Apollo are able to source deals privately uh, at wider spreads than you can get in the public markets, and and uh, there's a there's a thirst for yield as as we're seeing. Um, just switching gears a little bit, Colleen, um, the role of banks has changed over the years, obviously, with the decline of relationship lending. Um, how are banks rethinking their, their role in the capital markets, and maybe how could that potentially create opportunities? Well, I, Outside of what we spoke right. about already. Which is and important. I think you have to go by region a little bit. What's going on in Europe, what's going on in Canada, and what's going on in the U.S. are, are very different. But, and the, the big regulatory changes are still ahead of us. Uh, um, uh, but we are starting to see, and I think it was in the paper today, about Deutsche, I think, raising $10 billion worth of capital to, to start to, to reach the new capital requirements. The new liquidity requirements and talking about the, the BDCs and everything, what's ahead of us here is I think you're going to see the banks uh, uncompetitive in, as providers of liquidity to corporations going forward. The cost of their capital, uh, the way they're going to have to fund uh, liquidity, uh, the, the new rules around standby facilities, things like securitization vehicles that, that were very effective uh, given the way the banks used to fund them. That's all gone, and it's, or it's going to be gone. And, and um, so I think we're going to see uh, big changes ahead. I don't think it's really hit the markets yet, certainly within banks, when you run your return models and everything. And if you look forward to the, these new requirements and the new funding associated with it, um, the, these uh, nasty things that we've done for relationship reasons from a return point of view, like revolvers, uh, they, it's just not going to make sense. So I think you're going to see uh, uh, companies carrying more cash as, as a way to fund liquidity going forward as opposed to having uh, a provision of, of, of uh, revolvers. I think there's going to be more just-in-time financing. Uh, the market uh, up till now, companies have been able to carry uh, massive uh, loan commitments undrawn. Those are going to be extremely exp ex expensive uh, going forward. So um, I, I think that the, these sorts of um, uh, changes in terms of different providers is just going to accelerate 
And it's not just going to be for small and medium-sized companies. I think it's going to be for the very large ones. So what, what are the potential ways that investors could take advantage maybe um, around opportunities, as Colleen is describing, um, not maybe in the mid to small um, sector, but maybe a little bit larger cap companies? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess from our perspective, there's a couple of things I think will change. Uh, we're, we're mainly focused domestically, but I think one of the big changes you will see is in Europe. Europe is a predominantly bank loan oriented market. Uh, when you look at new issuance, it's almost all in the bank debt market. And it has been that way for relationship reasons for many years. And as we look forward with the rules coming in place, and as you mentioned, when you talk about the fact that uh, the banks won't do a lot of these relationship things, what we think will happen is the bond market will develop much more significantly in Europe because bonds are much easier to distribute to investors than bank loans. And oh, that'll happen over you know, the next few years. And so we think there's going to be a real big opportunity in Europe uh, to build out uh, the European bond market, which historically has been not a diversified market and a very illiquid market. Well, so and it was kept, its change. development really was held back by the fact that the, the, the bank funding market over there was artificially priced. It really wasn't market priced. Right. Uh, it wasn't capitalized. So you, the money was cheap because capitalization was wrong of the financial system. So once that gets addressed, then, and I think certain sectors as well, there's been there's going to be some very attractive uh, opportunities in the high yield market around very non-traditional sectors. And, you know, in the last couple of years, for example, and as a Canadian-based uh, financial institution, mining was never a factor in, in the leveraged finance market. And uh, we've seen volumes in, in it's a, soft, a little softer right now just because of what's going on in, in, in mining. But it, it, it's uh, become a factor, uh, coal, base metals, gold, this year we saw our first silver deals, and, and I think that's here to stay, because uh, there's massive uh, project requirements in that market, uh, and so I think that's the sector. As well, what's going on in, in energy, uh, and, and you know, I almost hesitate to say it down here, but the, the oil sands in <laughs> Alberta, uh, massive, massive uh, financing requirements in that market, and, and the bond market's going to be a, a big, big uh, place for that, not to mention what's going on in the Dakotas, the shale gas, uh, LNG, uh, all, the, all the structural requirements around that. There's going to be massive uh, spending around that, and that might have been done in the bank market in the past. I think those sorts of financings are going to gravitate towards the bond market. Will infrastructure funds play a role in that as well? Yes, and you know, infrastructure historically has been a high-grade uh, pursuit, but the other piece of this is with the amount of development I think there's going to be a role in the leveraged finance space during the construction uh, for these things. You don't want to uh, do your 30-year financing uh, as a high-yield play, which you might well be while the construction risk is there. Uh, you'll want to do the high-grade financing at the end of development. And so I, whereas it might have been all bank capital in the past, I think capital markets could you, play a big role in that. You'll also probably see... Um ultimate end users of um, natural gas, specifically in the LNG exportation space. You'll see major institutions, British Petroleum, institutions in Japan who will go forward commitments and who will also put equity to help uh, finance and equitize the ability for these companies to be able to access the, uh, the capital markets for debt. You're talking about massive projects um, I'm, I'm cognizant of a project going on in Houston. There's going to be a need for $8 billion of capital. And you have very savvy entrepreneurs who are using their intellectual capital to figure out how to monetize these opportunities. But I believe you'll see flows uh, from foreign and strategic capital where the end user you know, has a need for this and they're willing to put their capital uh, at risk. One, just Christina, one other area in which we think that there's obviously growth opportunities for, for investors that are, that are in search of yield. And again, I work in the distressed field, but uh, the municipalities all across the United States, several of which are, are facing, uh, facing crisis either today or sometime in the future. We're currently working in, uh, in Jefferson County, Alabama's situation that are involved in Detroit. These are situations where you see a, a convergence of a traditional distressed investor as well as municipal finance, in which there frankly hasn't been distress yeah. up until now. 
uh, there, there's the, the path is much less trodden. The Chapter 9 process it is, doesn't have the, the requisite case law surrounding it. Creditors are, are uh, it's uncertain it's as to exactly how they're going to be able to achieve a re reorganization of the municipality. There's all kinds of politics involved. We traditionally work with, with distressed investors, hedge funds and the like, who are looking for, or IRR investors, who are looking for a business deal, which you typically would see in the corporate world. You have to understand there's a lack of transparency when you get to the municipal world. And there's also a, just a remarkable overlay of a political, pol political overtones that are just very, very difficult for anybody to, to do diligence. You're, you're looking at a, you're effectively negotiating with a constituent or, or counterparty who are ultimately politicians who are looking out for political careers. It's not that they're irrational, they're just thinking about it very differently and how it's going to be perceived in the press. But at the same time, the reason that all of that may sound a little scary, at the same time it's interesting for investors because when you think of who traditionally invested in this space, it's large European banks some of which are in some type of runoff or liquidation mode, who are ill-suited to, to make decisions and, and to quickly uh, navigate the process, uh, to large mutual funds who are unwilling to take the political, uh, the, the reputational risk of being perceived as being aggressive or negotiating against a municipality who is making decisions which are un unpopular because there may be cuts in services and the like. So it's another area in which you'll be starting to see an, an, an interesting inroads for, for investors to pursue that they typically haven't. Seems Do like the prices reflect that? The, so there, that sounds like a, an awful lot of uncertainty relative to what we're used to looking at in U.S. or even international corporate distress. Do the municipal bond uh, prices give you the reward potential with that risk? On new issuance, I think the answer is probably no. They're not, they're not pricing in new risk. There, there's a divergence of you know, special revenue obligations which are set up as a, a sewer system, a water system, a parking garage, where you have a lien on special revenues. Those are traditionally going to be, if they're properly structured, you're going to be in a, in a decent place. It's the general revenue obligations, the so-called GOs, where it's just a wide uncertainty. Yes, the municipality has the willingness or the ability uh, legislatively to tax a populace, whether it's sales tax or real estate property taxes or excise taxes, but it's the willingness of the politicians to actually implement, or frankly the ability. You know, in the situation in Detroit, it, it, although there are bonds in Detroit which have unlimited, they're literally in the, in, in the, uh, the official statement, it says that the municipality has unlimited, uh, has given away the unlimited ability to tax as much as possible to pay back the loans. Realistically, that can't happen. Detroit has, has all kinds of problems, which we all see in the press with regularity. You can't just continue to tax a population into oblivion in order to repay a financial creditor. It just won't work. We're trying that in the U.S. <laughs> the global scale, yeah. right? <laughs> two, two years ago, we looked at an opportunity um, as an institutional entrepreneur to work with the state of Illinois. State of Illinois, and I'm not proud to say because I'm from the state of Illinois, at least I was born in the state of Illinois. I'm no longer a resident of the state of Illinois. Uh, it's probably the worst financially uh, constructed state right now with their unfunded pension obligations. But beyond the unfunded pension obligations, they are so far behind in paying their vendors. I believe it's close to nine to 11 months that these vendors are, are owed billions of dollars. So we approached the state of Illinois in terms of forming a partnership where we were going to provide liquidity to the vendors. Because right now, the vendors get 1% a month penalty interest. So roughly 12% cost of capital to the state of Illinois, where I believe their bonds, I haven't looked recently, are trading maybe in the 3 to 4% range. So there was an absolute arbitrage to pick up six or seven, 800 basis points by creating an unregulated finan financing uh, entity. I actually show the opportunity to, to Milken, and he didn't, think there were, he didn't think it was wide enough and there was enough yield, because eventually we were only getting roughly a 10% discount. We decided not to pursue it, because, not because of the opportunity to put out billions of dollars of capital, but dealing with the logistics and the ineptitude of these bureaucrats. Um, I mean, they're, 
it's, it's no wonder why some of these states have the problems that they do. Well, that goes back to, to Soren's point, which is probably a lot of these investors, hedge funds, got in a little over their heads when buying this debt. It's definitely a, it's a path that's not well understood, and, and they're they're learning some of them the hard way as to what uh, what how they have to navigate the process. At the same time, there are because most people won't touch it, like most people won't touch tribal gaming because it's uncertain. The fact is that people are going into it. There are large chunks of uh, when debt becomes available, they can get sized very very quickly because if a, a European institution or or a um, a mutual fund typically they're very chunky pieces. So you'll see a 40, 50 million dollar, 100 million, 500 million dollar block come on the market, be sold quickly. So if you're able to diligence and be prepared, you can get sized very quickly, which is a part of the problem in the distressed community today. There's so much liquidity that they can't get yeah. size. And it's not worth the time and effort if I can only put five million dollars to work. So let's switch gears a little bit um, and talk about pension underfunding, it's no surprise that 94, I think we have a slide that shows 94% of pensions are underfunded, um, according to Bloomberg data. Is there any product out there that help, will help uh, pensions solve this problem? <laughs> Not about, you know, product per se, but uh, for years now, uh, our firm has been We've had reverse inquiries from pension funds trying to chip away at the problem. And one of the interesting things about higher yielding instruments, and by that, you know, we're not talking about where the current high yield market is, but some of these private deals that, you know, are able to Excuse access, me. bless you, whether it's, you know, direct lending or uh, mezzanine lending, or, you know, you mentioned some of the challenges in Europe uh, with $200 billion of refinancings needed. Uh, we can now, on direct deals in Europe, command 13 and 14 percent yields. Um, so what, what the uh, underfunded pensions are looking to do is mathematically chip away at that problem by putting together uh, specialized fixed income portfolios. And a number of major consultants in the United States have been reached out to you know, firms like ours to do that. So that, that's one way to to get at the problem, but it, you know, it's, it's a long path. I mean, a lot of them are going into alternative uh, asset classes like, especially if they have a, an, in, an indexed uh, uh, liability stream, you know, uh, infrastructure assets, for example, uh, are, are ones that the, certainly the Canadian pension funds have been, because they have a big index component, have been looking at for years, but uh, a product to fix this problem is a bit like you know Bernanke thinking the liquid, liquidity can fix the uh, you know the, the larger problems. I mean they have structural problems, and I think they're also understated because I don't think that their assumptions on rate of return that measures this underfunding is uh, accurate. Now, Justin, I know that you have a view on a phenomenon that Mark brought up around pensions using managers for asset allocation strategies. Well, I think the the question you asked, which is you know, is there a product to solve this problem? I think that is the question you're being asked, but I think it's completely the wrong question. And I think it's what's leading pension funds down a really challenging path. They're looking for that one product, which is why now alternatives become like a fancy word to mean 20% return uh, guaranteed or something like that. Um, I, but I think what Mark said is right, which is that they, you do need to chip away at it. And one of the risks we see in the market is as pension funds have been underfunded, what, they're, what they do is it puts pressure on money managers to focus on benchmarks and beating a return characteristic because the pension funds are so focused on making up that miss uh, on their returns. And that leads investors to take additional risk. And that's usually where you see mistakes being made. And so as we go forward and this underfunding continues, uh, there is a real risk that uh, pension funds, not only on the underfunded side, but on their investment side, wind up pushing investors to make uh, bigger and bigger uh, risks. That being said, one of the ways that they can really work, I think, to help solve it is to have barbelled strategies across different asset classes. And one of the things we're seeing is really uh, the pension funds being willing to outsource the decision, at least in leveraged finance, 
between the different asset classes. And given the macro environment, which is changing so quickly and at a, at a speed uh, that we really haven't seen historically, those closer to making those decisions are better able to move, whether it's between high yield and bank loans or convertibles uh, or, or MEZ, uh, you're, they're able to move between those asset classes a little bit more efficiently. Uh, and I do think that's a positive trend that does, does seem to be happening. I think the pension funds are going to have to um, readjust their expectations on yield. I mean, we're in a zero interest rate environment. I don't think it's appropriate. They can't adjust their expectations. Well, they're going to make they have obligations. Well, I mean, like that's they're going to have to hit the reset button. <laughs> I mean, Illinois is not going to figure out this ninety billion dollar delta, and assuming you can continue to grow your assets at eight percent a yield, and I've had this debate with Mike, it just, it's not going to happen. You know, you're talking about 700 basis points spread. You know, if you look at the history, you haven't been able to achieve that. And it's a real problem. I, you're going to see a lot of pension, pension funds, in my opinion, I could be wrong, hit the reset button. Interestingly, the states that are not in quite as much fiscal distress are able to start managing down. I believe the state of Indiana, who we manage money for, is down to like six and three quarters now on their targets. Correct. Which is, you know, by the way, still a challenge. It's a challenge in this right. environment, but it's it's something you can surmount. Eight eight percent is is virtually impossible, I think, right now. A lot of the uh, large historical buyout players, like Apollo, KKR, um, Blackstone, are actually moving towards developing or marketing more credit-oriented vehicles. You know, can you? Talk to me about how, and this historically places where, I mean, probably with the exception of Apollo, it, it hasn't really been their sweet spot. What, how has that impacted what, what you do, Mark? Well, uh, you know, it, at the moment, you know, it, it hasn't affected us uh, that much because our direct lending and our proprietary investing is so focused. But clearly, it's their main, the main engine of growth for all of those firms. Uh, one of the KKR partners uh, said to my partner, Jean-Marc Chappas, that you know, they're, they think they can even take on the big banks. Forget about looking at, you know, I don't think we're the ones who have to worry. I think it's, it's some of the larger institutions that firms like KKR are setting their sights on that they can provide a better solution in terms of provision of capital. Uh, and, and I think uh, while it you know, obviously serves those firms in terms of asset growth, what those firms are seeing is that they're trusted fiduciaries for investors who are looking for solutions. And uh, more and more investors looking for solutions are willing to turn the uh, asset allocation strategy over to uh, investors that they trust. So, uh, you know, KKR and Apollo, I think, are more and more getting into strategic partnership type situations with clients. By the way, even firms like Is that ours, a good idea? You give managers uh, that much say? Well, like every, I, I think it's a good idea, but I have to because uh, we actually have <laughs> cities and states and corporate plans that do that with us too. Uh, so it's, it's good business for us. But um, I think like anything else, if good ideas, if, if the pendulum swings too far, you can have excesses um, or if the challenges are too great. So in theory, it's, it makes sense to put a bunch of managers out there, say, you know, do what you, know, you do best. What often comes with that is the client saying, OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to put you in competition, and we're going to see in five years who's generated the most returns. Here's X chunk of capital, is sometimes as much as a billion dollars. Let's see where, where we are in five years. Well, if you're running a race, and you feel you're falling behind in the race, you might start taking excess risk that you wouldn't otherwise take. And by the way, in a circumstance where you don't really need, you know, for all of these funds, we're talking about 8% being you know, difficult to surmount. If you can generate, you know, I'll call it 10% returns on a, on a blended basis for clients. Unleveraged or, un unleveraged or leveraged? Well, I, well one of the challenges, that's a very good question because what's happening now is if, if we went out, uh, in fact, when we were, uh, uh, talking about our, our funds and what we did. At one point, we talked about leveraged finance. If we went out and talked about that in 2009, everybody thought we were leveraging our investment products. So we don't want to leverage, right? Well, now, 
now, uh, not only do folks want to leverage, but you know, we go out and say, well, you know, we can do a total re return swap program or TRS program for you with two times leverage, and clients say, well, what about three times leverage? So I can get that much extra return. And uh, yeah, so it's a very, and this is all, every one of these conservative clients, this is state pension funds, city plans, uh, corporate plans, are all very interested, well, can I put a little leverage on that to get more return? Because you know, they start by saying, uh, how much risk is in your underlying asset? And we talk about you know, where we are in the credit cycle and low multiple of debt to cash flow. And in a lot of these private products, by the way, a real covenant protection, not, like, you know, not covenant light at all. Next question, well, can we leverage that? And so you know, our, we have uh, direct lending that you know, we think is pretty good at 8%, but folks you know, ask us to put a turn of leverage on that so they can get you know, 10 to 12%. That, that was exactly your point that you were making before, just investors pushing. Um, and at this point, is it concerning to anyone that you know, managers are perhaps being forced to or indeed applying more leverage in their strategies? Is risk beginning to creep up a little bit too much? I think it's hard not to be somewhat concerned about it. You know, investors left to their own devices have very short-term memories, uh, and bankers have even less of a memory. Some might argue no memory, which is what makes them good bankers. Um, <laughs> but, but isn't it interesting but, this is all going on? You've got a deleveraging of the regulated banking system going on in spades around the world, and we have a leveraging up on the investment side because our central bankers are keeping rates low, and so the only way you can hit your bogey is to lever up. I, I mean, it is a very interesting juxtaposition of forces, you know. Uh, well, BDCs at the same are time. seeking to go from one to two, right? Times right. It. They're looking one for one more turn of leverage. One more turn of leverage. Right. Turn of leverage right. But the, the one area that's not leveraging up is corporates. They seem to be the one area yeah. of the of anywhere that's actually learned from the crisis. Is that the smart money? You know, then it, well, it's it's pretty amazing. I've, we've been here for a couple of days. We've heard about how corporations have more cash than they ever have and they have to put it to work and that's how we have to get the economy going. And then we've had two days of investors saying, you know, markets are toppy, I wouldn't be putting my money to work right now or a policy and you know, we're selling if everything if it's not nailed down. But yet the corporate should be investing. So something doesn't seem to make sense there and I think the fact corporations are holding on to their cash is actually what keeps the market in a really good position. The, the economy is in a fragile position. For now, I think it is very positive for the credit markets at least that corporations are holding on to as much cash as they are. It might not be as positive for the equity markets over the short term because it's not a good ROI, but it is very good as far as uh, de the well, debt well, market the ca That cash is effectively gonna become the cushion because as we've talked about earlier, exactly. there, there are no covenants involved in any of these right. agreements. So that cash is, is what's gonna provide them with a cushion that if there are bumps in the road and there always is in a business plan, that's the only thing that keeps them from, uh, from defaulting earlier. But just to, to the other point that you were bringing up about equity firms getting more involved in, in fixed income products, I mean, frankly, the same is happening on the fixed income firms creeping oh, yeah, into mission creep or, uh, of getting more involved in equity. Why? Because of the search for yield. I mean, they're, they're um, the credit-driven hedge funds that are looking out to try to do private equity type transactions are actually investing in equities or even some commodities where they are searching for a return that they can't otherwise find in the fixed income markets. Yeah. It's all about in investors. Many of these firms, whether it's, we've, we've talked about Aries and Apollo, there are many others, Crescent for one, who will continue to grow and you continue to get AUM and, and AUM is what's that stable AUM base is what creates value for the owners of these businesses. So it's natural for them, as they develop their brands, to continue to want to attract capital and provide more and more products. Which is why you're going to see consolidation in the alternative asset management space, and the big are going to get bigger. And if you're not managing you know, several billion dollars, it's going to be very, very hard to compete. The big are going to get bigger. It sounds like that's the problem that the banks had. So I mean, but this the question is, 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 this is on a deregulated basis. Yeah. Well, right. for now. For now. <laughs> um, another uh, potential source of funding that a lot of managers are exploring or looking into is obviously the untapped uh, $3.57 trillion that Americans have accumulated in their 401ks. What are you guys seeing in terms of um, trying to get at that money? 
I think you're going to see some interesting new mutual fund products established. Um, you've heard that KKR is trying to get into the mutual fund business. The, f the future of funding private equity opportunities, I think, will come more from mutual fund products than will come from pension funds over time. I mean, that's where the growth is. Um, you can see a lot of creative vehicles that are going to get established. Uh, you know, we're working on a couple interesting private investment vehicles that, um, you know, you're going, to have, you're going to have an issue with the accredited investor issue. But, you know, if you look at some of the crowdfunding things, some of the accredited investor issues are going to go away. But you're going to see some really interesting creative vehicles that are going to fund private equity and other alternative investment products in, in the very near, very near term. Just going back uh, to our discussion around uh, risk, I guess one of the things that you know, nobody ever really talks about because it's difficult are, are the unintended consequences of you know, what you were saying about investors looking for more risk. Um, you know, can you guys give me your thoughts on what you may be worried about um, protecting maybe your investors or your clients on? Do you want to take that, Soren? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely think that the, the, we're, what we're ultimately doing, as we said earlier, we think there's a bubble. I think there's a bubble. Uh, that, that you're delaying the day of reckoning. And ultimately, when that bubble bursts, it just bursts louder, it's noisier. Are we talking a credit bubble? <clears throat> I think it's a credit bubble. I focus on the credit market. So I'm, when I talk okay. about bubbles, I'm talking about credit bubbles, where I think that um, the, the lack of, again, those lack of investor protections that ultimately when the companies are brought to the table, that there will be less there. And, and when you, you're not able to focus on restructuring a business or figuring it out when it's stressed, when it trips its business plan, it's not, consi it's not uh, performing just the way we'd hoped it would, as opposed to when it's distressed. And ultimately, when it's distressed, enterprise value doesn't increase. Enterprise value erodes in those businesses. Covenants are intended to prevent companies from getting into that distressed situation. They're speed bumps, if you will. If you don't have the speed bumps, you go straight into the brick wall and you crash. And ultimately, you have managers who are not focusing on building the next great product, hiring people, exploring new, new brands. Instead, they're focused on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, managing everything for cash, managing the distress, and they've got their eye off the ball. And enterprise value shrinks when that happens. Yeah, but at the same time that we're saying that uh, you know, everything's gone covenant light, we're saying that companies have a lot of cash. So I think actually you're seeing managers. Well, there are, only a, there are only a handful of companies that have a lot of cash. Like, we focus on those companies because they're the big names, the Microsofts, the, you know, the Apples now that, that have that cash. And a lot of that cash is, off, is, is not here. It's I think even, even in, you know, one of the reasons there was uh, such a slow recovery in the United States, or, you know, we all, it's interesting because in 2008, 2009, everybody talked about a, a U-shape or bathtub-shaped recovery. And then when it came, everybody said, boy, this recovery is so slow, and it's everything we predicted. Uh, corporate managers are much more disciplined now. We see, uh, if we look at our, again, our private portfolio of companies, capital spending on average is down. So deals that we're funding now, companies have lower cap capex. Companies are slower to hire. They're much more disciplined as, as we come out of the recession. Uh, in bringing workers back or finding more efficient ways to do things. So I think, and I believe companies, although maybe not to the investment grade, you know, Apple, Microsoft levels, but even high yield companies are husbanding their cash more. So I believe managers or s executives are much more disciplined. And I think you have to look very hard, not just at the covenants, although we, we're with you, Co covenant light is not good, uh, but with the talent of management teams for managing leverage. The good news in that is oftentimes, you know, we finance and refinance a company now back 20 years. We, we finance the same company four and five times. So it's a company we know, it's a management we know, and I think you can get past some of these. Uh, are are high-yield companies really husbanding cash? I mean, can they? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely not leveraging up the way yeah. they have been, and they're definitely not investing in capex. Most of the stories you hear about really are cost-cutting and improving margins. But I think to your question of, what we worry about for our investors. Uh, we're not as worried about a, a credit issue, just given a lot of things we've talked about, but we do worry about liquidity. Uh, you know, I think that the, the, the credit markets have, given the growth, have 
there's an implicit belief that liquidity is very significant in these markets. And these are semi-illiquid asset classes. And you generally only feel it when the markets go down. Um, and so we re what we do talk to our clients about and what we do worry about is when you have some of these air pockets that are natural to happen, uh, when they don't happen for a while, people forget what illiquidity feels like. And we've had the ETFs grow in a relatively significant way in the bond market at least, and bank loans is increasing. And that will probably only exacerbate some of the liquidity issues uh, when, when the markets go down. So it's something that we do think quite a bit about, and we think that that's, if, if there's any risk in, in the near term, we think it's more liquidity related than it is anything Justin, else. don't you think there's almost a tale of two markets, though? If someone needs to raise a billion dollars today, there's any number of underwriters that are willing to get out there, under, underwrite, syndicate, and distribute it. If you need to raise $110 million today, I mean, it goes back to some of the discussion about middle market, it's tough. It's tough because the BDCs, yes, they're filling in the, the filling in the vacuum. The CLOs, they're coming back in vogue, but a lot of the lenders who were or were funded by the markets, non-deposit takers, who typically funded those types of companies, have have curtailed their lending to, to say the least. Uh, and, and frankly, a lot of the hedge fund community who would fill in the space, or the credit credit uh, credit investors, aren't interested in lending to a hundred million, a two hundred million dollar capital structure because they know that if they forget, people forget a lot, but one thing they don't forget is near-death experiences. And the near-death experiences a lot of funds had in 2008 and 2009 when, uh, when, when they woke up one morning and there was no bid, I mean, literally no bid for their paper. No one wants to play in those structures. And when we see prices move down 20 points in a $200 million bond issue overnight, that scares people, which means there's a vacuum of capital on that side of the scale. Yeah, I think Mark probably is better situated to answer that just given you know, the business of middle market that we talked about. And there, there does seem to be, it's, the competition's moved. It used to be CIT and, and those players. And it does right. seem to have moved to the alternative. And the money BDCs managers. are clearly and filling BDCs. that void. And the BDCs are also part, partnering with financial institutions like I, you know, the guys at Aries have a, have a, have a partnership joint venture with GE. So that $100 million tranche today is not a difficult place. As Not long as you're, if you're a sponsored portfolio company. I think if you're a non-sponsor, if you're a mid Midwestern mom and pop third generation business, you're in trouble because you don't have the access to the Apollo Aries who are traditionally placing capital with sponsor driven deals. They, they you know, a, a typical a traditional BDC or typical BDC will have a group of 10, 12 different f uh, sponsors that they will ride on virtually every one of the deals that they like. There's, it, there's, I, we're seeing a much wider net. I mean, uh, you know, we've been, we've, been giving, we've been plugging too much Apollo and Aries. I mean, there's a great firm like GSO, which is part of Blackstone, and, and they play in the middle market, and, and they've been phenomenal. Uh, there is so much capital out there, and because even individual families that own these businesses, and because of the transparency of information and news flow, it's not that difficult to find these sources of capital today. All right, you guys are gonna have to take it outside. Mm. Because uh, we're going to get called on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on this panel. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.